All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Eric Haugi, Executive, Executive Director of Homeline, and thank you for joining us today, Wednesday, June 3rd, um, for another one of our weekly webinars on tenant landlord law during the pandemic. Uh, reminder today, we are also going to be joined by um, managing attorney uh, Michael, Mike Brow will be covering uh, most of the presentation today. We're also joined by Homeline's lead tenant organizer and VISTA program director, Ivory Taylor, who uh, was involved with a, a city of Minneapolis implement, implementation team on uh, a set of new tenant landlord related ordinances and regulations that went into effect just this week. And we'll be covering those briefly today. And again, those are just specific to Minneapolis. Um, <clears throat> a reminder uh, who Homeline is, we are a statewide nonprofit organization that provides free legal organizing and advocacy services uh, for Minnesota renters. Our main program is a free legal hotline uh, that tenants throughout the state can call and get advice from tenant advocates and housing attorneys in uh, English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong languages. Uh, Homeline's been hosting these uh, webinars since mid-April every week and today is our uh, webinar that's designed for an audience of tenants, advocates, service providers and uh, every Thursday at 1.30 we do another webinar that's designated more for landlords and property managers. Um, again, uh, this is how you can contact our hotline if you are a tenant. We are providing general information, legal information and advice on these calls, uh, but if you are a renter and have a question, please uh, reach out to our hotline via that those numbers or on our website. And we also have re previous recordings of these events and, um, and general information about the pandemic uh, on our website at that link there. Uh, again, we have been asking for folks to submit questions in advance. We have a, a number of those in advance, but feel free to submit uh, your questions throughout the webinar today via the Q&A uh, Zoom system, and we will get to those uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as we're able to. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Homeline's Managing Attorney, Mike Brock. Thanks, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Mike Fry. I'm the managing attorney here at Homeline. I've been working with Homeline since 1996. And today we're going to talk about two uh, main, I guess, subject topics along with the questions that you have. The first is going to be sort of a quick update on the status of how COVID-19 interacts with landlord-tenant law uh, and sort of the update on what's going on in that arena uh, and where we see that going. And then uh, Ivory Taylor, our lead tenant organizer, is going to join us, our first guest speaker, I think, on any of these webinars, Eric, uh, which is kind of exciting, uh, to talk about a Minneapolis exclusive ordinance, a uh, pair of ordinances, uh, or actually several, that went into effect uh, Monday, June 1st, uh, which in past years would have been uh, probably headline worthy information. Uh, but because of obvious recent events, it's simply not gotten the coverage. And so we're going to talk about those Minneapolis specific only rules at that time. Uh, but uh, to start, we're going to give you a quick update on the COVID-19 stuff. And the, the main thing to talk about still is that a landlord in Minnesota is not allowed to uh, file an eviction for almost any reason uh, that they normally file evictions for. In Minnesota, well over 90% of evictions are filed for non-payment of rent. And uh, at present, under a governor's order, Executive Order 20-14, uh, a landlord is not allowed to file an eviction at present. That, uh, you know, there is an exception to that, or a couple exceptions to can a landlord file an eviction. One is if the tenant seriously endangers uh, the safety of other residents, or uh, if the tenant has violated a specific state law in Minnesota that talks about uh, illegal drugs, illegal weapons, um, prostitution, and possession of stolen property. Those are the only exceptions that a landlord can actually file an eviction in Minnesota for right now. Uh, and 
Under this order, the landlord is also not allowed to terminate a tenancy. So uh, most tenancies in Minnesota don't end with an eviction. There's somewhere between six and 700,000 uh, rentals in Minnesota that we know about that are licensed. Um, and there's maybe 15 to 20,000 evictions each year. So most tenancies don't end with an eviction. Usually it's somebody gave a notice to somebody else. Either the tenant gave a notice to leave, which is the most common version, or the landlord decided to non-renew the tenant or give, gave them a notice to quit or a notice to vacate. Uh, right now, the landlord can't enforce a notice to vacate. Uh, the theory behind both of these rules is that under COVID-19, the governor's office is prioritizing the concept of people staying where they are and forcing people to leave, especially in an eviction setting where a tenant may very well have lost their job, so their income source is gone. Uh, they, they don't want to have uh, a flood of evictions happening during the pandemic, basically. Um, rent is still due for a tenant under the governor's order. There's no question about that. It's really boldly stated in the executive order. There's no uh, gray area there at all. The rent is still due. Um, but if a tenant has not paid their rent, the landlord still can't file an eviction at present against the tenant um, under this executive order. The attorney general's office is the entity that is tasked with enforcing this order, uh, which again, bans evictions and terminations of tenancies. And they've been pretty active in this. I know that they've called, uh, I'm guessing hundreds of landlords at this point, uh, explaining the rule because it is a new rule. Uh, it's a brand new rule that came about in, in mid-March and has been effectively renewed, uh, tied to the peacetime emergency. We'll talk about the dates in a second. But it's been renewed for a couple of times, but these are new rules. So if you look in the landlord-tenant statutes, for instance, the, the chapter of landlord-tenant law that almost all Minnesota tenant rules are found is chapter 504B. You won't find this information in 504B. You won't find it in the Attorney General's Landlord-Tenant Rights Handbook. The only place you'll find this is in the governor's executive order. So it's a little bit difficult for some landlords and tenants to wrap their head around what this new rule is, how it applies, and things like that. Uh, so that's what the uh, order says. And as far as the next question, Eric, if you could flip the slide, how long will the order last is the next question that we always get. Um, the current order goes through uh, June 12th. So June 12th is a Friday. Uh, most courts aren't really effectively open in any meaningful way um, until Monday. So that means that under the current rule, there's no way a landlord could actually file an eviction for almost any case until June 15th, Monday, June 15th. Now, the really big question is, will this uh, eviction order get extended once again? Um, it could happen. The governor has the power to extend it. The, under the, the state law that grants the governor the power to declare a peacetime emergency and then start passing or enacting rules like these, uh, if the peacetime emergency extension occurs during a time when the uh, state legislature is not in session, then a special session must be called, which is, I don't know of any other situation where it must be called, but maybe there are, but uh, the governor must, uh, there must be a special session and the legislature has the power to override the governor and say, no, you can't extend the peacetime emergency anymore. However, both chambers of the Minnesota legislature, so the uh, Republican controlled Senate and the Democrat controlled House would have to agree to end the peacetime emergency if they wanted to stop the governor. Now the peacetime emergency is not just about evictions. There's lots of other facets to the peacetime emergency. But for the landlord-tenant purposes that we're analyzing right now, uh, the governor has the power to redo this for another month. And if they do, uh, they have to call a special session. As near as I can understand reading the, the rules, I think the governor would have to do that every month. They'd have to call a special session every month. And then the legislature, again, I'm not a special session expert, but I believe that the legislature has the power to do anything they choose to during a special session. They don't have to limit their uh, conversations to just uh, the peacetime emergency, they can talk about anything during a special session once it's called. Um, in general, the normal rule is the special session is only called if the governor calls it, but here it's automatically triggered if the governor extends the peacetime emergency. Mike, I wanted to jump in quick. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a mistake on the slide. 
Oh, it's what's the, what's it's the uh, executive order 20-53 is the current order that extends the peacetime emergency through the 12th. And I'll Thanks. put it in the chat. Excellent. Good, good catch there and for pointing it out. And we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, overshot it, I think. Did, oh, no, this is just the full slide. Okay. So the next part of this, though, is, um, well, I guess this is a good theme for today. Normally, when I talk about landlord-tenant law, and I talk about landlord-tenant law a lot, because that's what I've been doing for a long time, uh, what I'm almost always exclusively talking about is state law. Um, but right now, there's a, both a federal law that matters, and when Ivory joins us in a few minutes, she's going to be talking about some city ordinances that are starting to have a bigger role in landlord-tenant law in Minnesota. But for right now, the CARES Act is a federal law. Uh, this was enacted in late March, uh, where, again, we have a Republican-controlled Senate, Democrat-controlled House, and the president, obviously Republican, uh, all came up with this rule that is the law now. And it's got a lot of components to it. The CARES Act, you, you've heard of it in many settings, I'm sure. But it does apply to rental housing uh, as well. Um, not all rental housing, and we'll talk about which places it, it doesn't apply to, but let's talk about the dates first. First, what this CARES Act says is that a landlord is not allowed to file an eviction for non-payment, just non-payment of rent. So um, something like a, a, a dog, if a tenant's not supposed to have a pet and they bring a dog in, or they have an unauthorized occupant, the boyfriend moves in, um, the landlord could still file an eviction under the CARES Act if there wasn't the state moratorium. But for non-payment of rent, that is banned uh, through July 25th. So almost two months from now still. And that's not the end of it. The, the landlord on July 26th can give a notice telling the tenant they've got 30 days to pay up or else they'll file the eviction. So it's effectively a ban on evictions through late August uh, if the CARES Act applies. So those are the dates, but let's talk about which places are covered by the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act, who's covered? So any kind of federally subsidized housing, certainly the ones we have listed on the screen, low income tax credits, a section eight voucher, uh, those are all covered. The, the harder question is smaller buildings, one to four units that have federally backed mortgages like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, those are covered as well. Uh, the hard part here from a tenant perspective is they don't know whether a landlord in a duplex actually is federally insured or has a federally backed mortgage. It's almost impossible for that tenant to figure it out. Uh, our best guess is somewhere between, I don't know, 20, 30 to 50% of Minnesota rentals are probably covered by the CARES Act. But we don't know because we've never had to ask that question before as part of an eviction process. We are seeing that uh, courts, uh, certainly in, in many other states where evictions have resumed, uh, where they're requiring landlords to swear essentially under oath that they are not covered by the CARES Act because they're probably the only party that can really figure this out quickly. They can call their mortgage holder wherever they got their mortgage and say, hey, I need to know some more detail about how my mortgage came into being. Is this a federally backed mortgage or not? And so uh, we're seeing hints that in Hennepin County, certainly, which, which has the, the most, um, bu the busiest housing court in the state. There's only two real housing courts, Hennepin and Ramsey County. Everybody else, they use the regular district courts where everything else is heard by judges. Uh, but in Hennepin and Ramsey County, they have just such high volume that they created courts that do nothing but, uh, well, evictions. They do some other things, but it's almost all evictions. Anyhow, in those courts, we're seeing indications that they're going to be similar to what other states have done, requiring landlords to swear under oath that they have complied with the care, or that they're not covered by the CARES Act in order to file an eviction for non-payment. Ideally, we'd see the state Supreme Court just make a declaration about this. I don't think we've seen anything like that yet from the state Minnesota Supreme Court. Other states have done that, and maybe it's the fact that evictions simply can't be filed right now, so they don't feel any rush to uh, make a, a declaration like that. But if we've learned anything from past governor's executive orders from Governor Waltz, it's sometimes they're announced and there's almost an immediate effect that the governor says, you know what, starting tomorrow, you can get your hair cut or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, so our concern is that if the courts don't have something in place, we're going to see especially courts uh, outside of the metro area that are going to be wondering whether the CARES Act applies, if they even consider it at all. And so 
uh, that is a big concern in our non-metro courts uh, for our office and for all tenants throughout the state, it should be uh, whether or not the CARES Act applies to their situation. So again, Minnesota courts, uh, evictions aren't being scheduled right now unless we've got the safety of other residents or the guns, drugs, prostitution, stolen property. An ETRA, that's an emergency tenant remedies action by a tenant, uh, no hot water, no heat during the winter, not now obviously, uh, no running water, no working sanitary facilities like a toilet. Uh, if those aren't uh, functional, then the tenant can still use the emergency tenant remedies action. That is a fileable case right now that the court will schedule, along with a lockout where a landlord has changed the locks on a tenant, although the attorney general's office will probably step in, essentially calling that uh, an eviction. Rent escrows are not really being scheduled yet throughout the state. Um, we're hearing that Hennepin County is starting to dip their foot in the pool for cases that were filed before the uh, pandemic really hit and the court started shutting down. Conciliation court, small claims court also not really being scheduled. How conciliation court matters mostly for landlord tenant disputes. Landlords use conciliation court to sue tenants for rent. That's different than an eviction. An eviction or an unlawful detainer is the landlord trying to regain possession. That's what they really win if they win an eviction. Whereas conciliation or small claims court is where the landlord goes to try to collect the money and get a money judgment against the tenant for rent that's unpaid. The other key thing for conciliation court and landlord tenant world is security deposit claims by tenants. By far the most common cases tenants sue landlords for in Minnesota are for the return of their security deposit. And at present, it's not really available to a tenant to file in conciliation court. Uh, I think that might be it for the intro to what's, yeah. So Eric, I'll let you go ahead and introduce uh, Ivory. Yeah, again, uh, so uh, Homeline's lead tenant organizer and VISTA program director, Ivory Taylor, is gonna join us now and go through, again, for everybody on the call, these are just Minneapolis specific. These do these these are within the, if if you're a renter in the city of Minneapolis, these uh, have begun to apply to you and landlords, um, and uh, and so this is not this is not going to be relevant to folks who are are renting in St. Paul or or outside of Minneapolis uh, in in a different city, um, but we're joined by Ivory Taylor who uh, uh, what has been on a a city convened community sort of implementation task force leading up to the, uh, the implementation of these ordinances that were passed last year. Uh, and so we're joined by Ivory and she's gonna go through these and uh, through the, the, the first couple and then uh, I'm gonna jump back in to talk uh, about one, one additional. Okay, thanks Eric. Um, again, my name's Ivory Taylor. I wanted to thank you all for joining us today in the midst of so much uncertainty and collective grief that our communities are going through. I'm happy that we can get you information on these new ordinances, which aim to better protect Minneapolis renters. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of what each ordinance, um, what the details are and how it will affect you um, if you're applying for or helping somebody apply for um, getting a rental unit. Um, so for the first thing to know is, is that effective June 1st, and this is a typo that I made, um, if the landlord has 16 or more rental units, this applies to them. And for December 1st, 2020, all Minneapolis landlords will be covered under these new rules. So again, June 1st, it'll be 16 or more units, landlords, that includes units in a portfolio. So it doesn't have to be in one property, it can be multiple properties. Um, and then December 1st for all Minneapolis landlords. So the first tenant screening ordinance looks at the way that tenants can be screened when they are applying for an apartment. And that covers criminal history and it limits the look back time for criminal history. So things that cannot be considered is misdemeanors over three years old, felonies older than seven years, and specific felonies older than 10 years. And there's a specific exception for the manufacturer distribution of drugs and lifetime sex offender registry 
they can always be um, considered. There is no time frame for those. And this ordinance also covers credit scores. Uh, a landlord can no, no longer use a credit score alone to deny an applicant um, or a credit at all. They can't use the score. Um, they can use info in a credit report. Um, some info that might be relevant is um, rental payment history, utilities, a mortgage payment history, things like that. And a lack of credit history can't be used against an applicant. So for any of the various reasons, people might not have a built up credit history that can no longer be um, a reason to deny their ability to get housing. And then um, for income, income requirements three times or higher th than the rent, if that is the landlord's income requirement, they must allow applicants to demonstrate that they can meet rent obligations even if they don't have that income requirement. So if, for instance, if a tenant has two times the rent and in income, but has a history of successful rent payments at that same level and can provide that, that history, they would have to allow them to rent in that unit. Additionally, rental history is considered in this new ordinance and covered. A landlord can't hold an eviction against an applicant if the eviction was dismissed or the tenant won a case. So not at all can they hold those situations against an applicant. If the eviction was settled or if no writ of recovery was issued over a year ago, and if the eviction is three years old or older, it can no longer be used against a tenant. There are also um, those, that type of screening that I just mentioned is called the inclusive screening criteria. If a landlord wants to use criteria that is more restrictive than that, they have to conduct an individualized assessment for any basis that they deny an application. So what that means is the landlord must allow a tenant to submit supplemental evidence and evaluate it to determine their, um, that they would be a successful renter. And some of the things they as landlords have to consider is the nature and severity of the incidents that would lead to a denial, the number and type of incidents, the time since the incidents occurred, and the age of the applicant at the time of the incident. So with inclusive screening, if people are denied under this, if landlords had used inclusive screening and people are denied, they must state within 14 days in writing to the tenant that they were denied and specify the criteria that they failed to meet. And if it's for criminal history, the landlord must have considered the supplemental evidence the applicant provided. For an individualized assessment, the 14-day rule also applies and the landlord must state the basis for the denial and that the supplemental info wasn't sufficient. And the landlord has to retain the records of this application for two years, which can be reviewed by the Department of Regulatory Services upon request. And this is Eric again, I'm gonna jump in because there's been a couple questions kind of related to, uh, to the, the Minneapolis ordinances, which again, so there's these two, two options that landlords can go, the inclusive screening, which was the, the, the pieces outlined in the ordinance specific uh, specifically stating you, you you have to use these guidelines or you can do this individualized assessment on the on somebody had a question about what does it mean when an eviction is dismissed versus expunged do you want to take that mike sure uh an eviction is dismissed um well to, the most common example i can think of for dismissal is when neither side shows up um, which actually happens much more often than you might think. The landlord files an eviction, the tenant leaves before the actual court date a couple weeks later, and then the landlord figures, well, I, I got everything I can get out of this. I got possession back, so I don't need to go to court, so the case gets dismissed. Um, there's other reasons for dismissals, but uh, a dismissal is where the case still shows up as being filed against a tenant uh, versus an expungement. An expungement Effectively, the court is erasing or deleting the file, so there's no electronic record anymore that the eviction was ever filed. And expungements require 
a motion by the tenant to ask the court to remove the eviction from the uh, screening his, or from the court records. So an expungement uh, is much better for a tenant, uh, obviously, than a dismissal would be. And then uh, there's sort of a follow-up question about um, if a case is dismissed, it, yes, it, it, somebody's asking, it still shows up in, in, as an eviction on their record. Uh, the court system will actually say dismissed. So th that should be enough evidence for the tenant to uh, demonstrate that it's been dismissed. Um, and then there's a question about why does age matter when considering a housing application? I'm not sure um, that it does. I don't, I don't think that's a piece. So of that is a piece for the, um, the individualized assessment. Basically what I, what I, I think it's referring to is if people have juvenile offenses um, that somehow show up on their record that that's likely to not be considered valid for an adult that's now trying to obtain housing, a valid reason to deny them. With a, I think there was a, a collective understanding that. Um, I, that I think there was also the rule uh, that the landlord has to consider in the uh, individualized assessment that the, they look at, at uh, you know, the age of the person when the incident occurred. Um, was one of the things that they're supposed to assess, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I was referring so, to. Right. So you know, I was, I was a, I was a, you know, less mature eighteen-year-old when that occurred. Now I'm twenty-five, so I don't want you to hold it against me. That kind of thing. All right. So I'll move on to security deposit. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I did want to touch base on one thing that I think we just have kind of misleading in the slides. The uh, June first start for the sixteen and under units is just for the application question. The security deposit cap is for all landlords. It's not just 16 units and under. Um, that starts right now. So the, the one on your screen today, the security deposit one, is June 1st for all landlords, not just uh, landlords with a bigger portfolio. 16 units and above. Yeah. Yes, right, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so the second ordinance is related to security deposit caps. And basically it says that security deposits are limited to one month's rent. So you can't charge two months rent, three months rent um, security deposit. It has to be maxed at the amount of one month's rent. So if a landlord charges the first and last month's rent in addition to a security deposit, the deposit can only be half of a month's rent. And if they do this, a landlord must allow the tenant to pay the deposit over three months in installments. So again, that one's a little confusing, but basically the security deposit, if a landlord only charges first month's rent, can only be one month's rent in terms of the amount. And if they charge first and last month's rent to move in, it can only be half a month's rent and that can be paid in three months in installments. So an exception to this is if a tenant got the place through a referral from a nonprofit service provider or government agency, one and a half times the month rent is allowed. A lot of times nonprofit providers um, use a, an increased security deposit to help secure space for tenants that have um, more challenges in their background. Um, so that, that was an exception that was placed in the ordinance to allow for that. Um, and then in terms of the security deposit, landlords are supposed to provide a written statement approved by the city covering the tenant's rights under state law and the ordinance. And uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next section, which is about a, a couple other ordinances that went into effect regarding relocation assistance. But there was a question about what do we do if, if, if there's landlords not following the rules? Um, and I think the general answer to that is that, uh, first of all, you know, ha folks should call us um, if they feel like uh, uh, that, you know, the, a landlord is not following it and we can look at the details of an individual case and, and talk through it. Um, but the city is, is tasked with enforcing this for the most part. So um, the Department of Regulatory Services, which is, is the department that does uh, housing inspections, uh, they are prepared to enforce this and um, investigate situations and uh, 
and then if if they find violations, then uh, they are they are able to penalize landlords and do a number of other things uh, around license rental license enforcement. And Eric, I, I think our best guess here is that the security deposit rule is going to be probably followed by landlords uh, more than the the application thing for one main reason. It's a lot simpler. Uh, the security deposit cap is is Ivory's right. It's a little bit confusing. There are some some exceptions to how it applies, but there is a cap and it's just an understandable notion. Um, the application question, uh, the, the question that we've sort of had from the beginning and a lot of people have been asking is what's a landlord likely to do? Are they going to do the individualized assessment or are they going to go with the uh, city's version of uh, criteria that they should use? And we really don't know until we see sort of how landlords decide to uh, approach this because they're the ones that do the screening. They get to unilaterally decide which approach to take. We can't really be sure what they're, what they're going to do. So we really do want to hear from tenants that are running into things or applicants, I should say, uh, to see what they're encountering and we can help analyze their situation under the ordinance and, you know, let them know if it makes sense to contact the city. Yeah. Yeah. And I can go further into um, enforcement things just a, a little bit. Um, if a renter believes there's been a violation of the ordinance, they will make a complaint to 311 describing the detail of the violation. The case will be routed to a reg services, regulatory services staff, um, who, who will is a rental housing liaison who will communicate with the owner and the complainant and regulatory services with conciliation from the city attorney's office will determine if the complaint is valid. If it's if it's founded to be a valid complaint, regulatory services may opt to issue an, an advisory letter to the owner in order to cease a citation or a director's order of non-compliance. And Eric, I noticed one other question that was really focused on what we're talking about right now, and it's pretty basic. Is Minneapolis Minneapolis only, or does it include suburbs such as North Minneapolis? Now, uh, you live in North Minneapolis, right, Eric? I sure do. Yeah, so you'd call that Minneapolis, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, Minneapolis, North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, those aren't actually suburbs. Those are, you know, uh, are they officially called neighborhoods? Is that what they're referred oh, to? I mean, there are separate, there's, I think, 87 neighborhoods in Minneapolis. Yeah. So they're just parts of Minneapolis. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, you got to get up to Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, Robbinsdale, uh, St. Louis Park, those suburbs are specifically bordering Minneapolis that are not Minneapolis, but this is just the city of Minneapolis, but it is all of Minneapolis, including North Minneapolis. And then one last thing is for service providers, um, we are working on a like a toolkit and a commun with communication materials and things for um, service providers that we can, that we'll be sending out to, to different providers, I would say. Um, send me an email and we can provide my email. Um, it's ivory T I V O R Y T at homeline MN.org. And I can get your organization on that list. So then the last, uh, the last piece that is, that we want to talk about again, Minneapolis only is relocation assistance. There is already a relocation, um, assistance, ordinance that's been in place for I think over a year now that was very specific around of, uh, the sale of uh, affordable housing, uh, affordable housing defined uh, by the city as buildings with five or more units where at least 20% of the units are affordable uh, at a 60% AMI level. Um, and, and so it, that was already in effect basically if, if a landlord wanted to remove a tenant uh, um, in the th in the three during a three month period after a sale, uh, then they'd have to pay uh, relocation assistance. The, there's a new uh, relocation assistance or that, that has gone into effect on June first. Um, that is actually also it's in effect right now. Uh, the city council actually is um, is working on amending it to make some changes, uh, and they it went through a committee vote actually I think just yesterday. So it's in the process of being amended. But basically. Right now, as it stands, um, in cases where a rental, the city uh, revokes a rental license, denies a rental license, or the let rental license is canceled because the property is condemned through the actions or lack of action of the landlord. So they, they, they didn't fix the place, basically, or they, violated, they were violating 
uh, the city's ordinances and, and had their license revoked, um, then the tenant uh, is owed three months of rent for relocation assistance. The changes that the city is considering um, and that passed this committee uh, just yesterday is amending it to also include situ scenarios where um, where a, where a property has had the unit revoked, denied, or, or, or condemned, and the landlord rents to a new tenant in that unit. And so it, it really didn't have a valid rental license. And also in cases where the landlord just never had the, a rental license. So those, those are not yet the law, but uh, very likely will become because they were approved by a committee. Um, Okay, I think with that, I don't see any, any questions. And Ivory, I assume you'll stick around in case folks do have questions about these ordinances, um, yep, along I'll with the here. other state law questions that I might be able to answer. Yes, I'll be here. Great. All right, so let me just make sure. Okay, so we're on the Q&A section. We have quite a few submitted already uh, and also some submitted in advance. So we're gonna go through those, those advanced ones quick. Uh, any guidance for how tenants can figure out if they qualify for the federal moratorium? Um, again, if you're in a larger building where there's a public subsidy that, that everybody knows about, there's no question. If you have a Section 8 voucher, there's no question. The hard questions are, if you're in a smaller building, does the landlord have a federally backed mortgage? I don't know how a tenant can figure that out without subpoenaing records. And it's probably something that's not logistically feasible in an eviction setting, which is a really hurry up kind of court case. Uh, so it really does rely on the landlord swearing under oath under penalty of perjury, I guess, that they are not bound by the CARES Act. Um, I wish there was a better answer that I could give tenants right now. I haven't seen a, a sort of snap your fingers solution for a tenant that they could find that information out quickly enough in that eviction setting. So the short answer is probably not. And I just put in the chat uh, a link that I'd sent earlier that um, that there's a there's a searchable database. Uh, National Low Income Housing Coalition has one, but the one that I put in the chat actually has an address search function. And so again, that that is limited uh, again limited to larger properties. It's still it's, right. there's still the gap. And it's a great place to start, but it's the smaller ones that are the really hard questions. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, a question in advance, how do these guidelines affect Wright County and Sherburn counties? I'm not sure if that was question was related to just generally about CARES Act or um, eviction suspension or if it's about the Minneapolis ordinances, but Minneapolis's ordinances obviously do not uh, impact uh, Wright or Sherburn counties. It's only tenants and landlords in the city of Minneapolis. But all the governor's orders that we've been talking about, banning evictions essentially and tenants uh, tenancies being terminated, those certainly do, do apply to every county in the state. As do the CARES Act. Yep. Um, are eviction courts currently in business as usual mode? Well, eviction courts are in business, but it's certainly not business as usual. Uh, if you had ever seen uh, Hennepin County's housing court, for instance, on a normal day uh, where they were actually hearing cases, they, they, in the past, they didn't hear cases every day of the week, I'm sure when they reopen, they're going to need to hear cases every day of the week. Uh, but what would generally happen is they'd have 20 to 50 cases in a two or three hour session. Um, and so there'd be way too many people crammed into a small space because again, if a tenant and a landlord are there, then somebody might have an attorney or the tenant might bring their, uh, there might be two people living there, roommates, so they might bring their kids because there's no childcare. So very crammed places. Um, Honestly, a very depressing thing to watch the eviction housing court um, system that we have just because it turns really efficiently. I guess that's a compliment on one level. On the other side, it's sort of depressing to think about how efficient that courtroom is. But that's the business as usual, right? That's the old business as usual. I don't know that business as usual is going to resemble that from the past. We're still going to have a lot of cases. That's not going to be a question. but jamming courtrooms full of people. I hope that's not business as usual until the COVID-19 pandemic has subsided or a vaccine is created or whatever to solve the uh, you know, mass number of people publicly gathering in, in one spot. Business as usual, I think is a long way off for certainly Hennepin and Ramsey County. Other courts are gonna be just as busy. 
um, throughout the state because we're not talking about just evictions. Everybody else that's been waiting to file a court case since March uh, is going to go down and file their cases probably when they can. And so getting court space is going to be difficult to do. Uh, business as usual, I'm not sure when from a, a lawyer's perspective or certainly a judge's or referee's perspective, we'll be back to anything resembling business as usual in the court system. It's probably going to take realistically years before courts resemble what they did in 2019 in Minnesota, if they ever do. I think there's gonna be a lot of Zoom cases. It's gonna be phone in cases. Um, maybe we're gonna discover that, that in-person appearances aren't as critical to court cases as we have thought since the dawn of our country. Uh, and before that, honestly, in, in England, I mean, there were always in-person cases, but we're in a different age and we have different concerns. So business as usual, I think is really unlikely anytime soon, no matter how close it gets to the old approach though, is gonna be how quickly the court can adapt. Can a renter save up all their rent um, and any sort of emergency assistance funds via COVID response and just walk off with no eviction? Yeah, yeah, I guess a tenant could do that. Uh, the landlord could still chase them for money. They could sue them for money in a different court because once again, an eviction is just about possession. So let's say the governor does in fact lift the suspension on evictions on, uh, that expires June 12th and on June 11th, the tenant realizes, oh, I think the governor is gonna lift that uh, suspension. So I'm gonna leave right now. I'm gonna give my landlord my keys. I'm gonna give them a piece of paper saying I'm giving up possession and I'm gonna get all my stuff out. Uh, then the landlord would not have the right to file an eviction, nor, nor should they. They'd be wasting their money. It'd be $300 down the drain, roughly, just to file the case. And they'd have to lie under oath. They'd have to say that the tenant is still in possession of the rental unit when they're not. They're not in possession anymore. So it wouldn't make any sense for the landlord to file it. It's, it's legally wrong for them to file it. It's perjury. Um, and the tenant could keep an eviction off their record. So, yeah, that scenario could happen. Do I think that's going to happen a lot? Maybe. Maybe uh, a tenant might do a cost-benefit analysis and think, you know what, it's worth it for me to do that. Sort of built into that question is kind of that jaded view of, hey, tenants are somehow getting rich off of this situation, which maybe so, but that's not the tenants that we're talking to. Uh, and it's not the landlords that we're talking to either. It's the tenants that just don't have access to money. They, they didn't get the federal stimulus for whatever reason. They aren't eligible for unemployment. Uh, those are the folks that aren't paying the rent as near as I can tell, not people with some master scheme to profit from this. And you've generally answered this, but I'll ask again uh, if you want to add more. Has the eviction moratorium been lifted? If not, when? Uh, it has not been lifted. Uh, again, I assume this one's about the governor's moratorium, so that's the state level. June 12th is when that expires. Uh, the governor has the power to renew it for yet another 30 days, which is sort of the uh, increments that we've seen and i think that's as far as the governor can go is the 30-day increments um this is all very confusing for folks because they hear about the shelter in place orders so i don't mind answering this question multiple times during a session like this because it's important and it's confusing we've all seen those dials the dials that the governor has been using to to sort of crank the state back open right like i think a couple days ago that salons opened up again and, and restaurants are now eligible to have outdoor seating which they weren't able to do on May 31st, but on June 1st, the dial got twisted a little bit more so people could, could do those things. But that system has nothing to do with the peacetime emergency declaration, which is what the eviction moratorium is based on. So it is confusing and that's the key thing. If you wanna know on the night of June 12th, what's going on with evictions, the governor probably won't say anything about evictions that night in a press conference. The governor will say, the peacetime emergency is no longer in place or we're going to extend it for another month. Those are really the two things. And if it's extended, then the moratorium on evictions continues as well. All right, now we're answering some that have been submitted today. Uh, in reality, how long would it take to get an eviction through the courts after June 15th, if it were opened then? Yep, really good question. Um, so the legislature and the governor, uh, enacted a new law that said that statutorily required deadlines are no longer um, really in play or have to be enforced by the courts. This matters for a lot of different reasons. There's a thing called the statute of limitations, which there's a, a time limit to file a case uh, 
um, certain type of discrimination cases, you only have a year to file. And if you miss that year, then you can never file the case, that kind of thing. Um, those were relaxed or essentially uh, ignorable for parties because there was no way to file cases during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that remains the case still. Uh, likewise, many court cases have built in time requirements that the court must hear a case by a certain date. Uh, evictions are among those. So if a landlord files an eviction in Minnesota, they are uh, guaranteed by the state to get a, an initial hearing at least within 14 days of filing the case. That is no longer necessarily required by the courts. Now we've heard from courts, especially again, Hennepin and Ramsey County, because they deal with so many evictions, they're sort of trying to forecast how things are gonna work, that they're gonna try to meet those deadlines. I don't know how legitimately realistic that is. We're seeing reports now from other states where they have lifted eviction moratoriums and we're hearing about how landlords are just lining up uh, to file cases hours before the courts are even open, uh, to file their one, two hundred cases that they might have, depending on how many units they have and how many people didn't pay their rent. And so uh, if that sort of wave of evictions happens in Minnesota, honestly, our courts just aren't built to deal with that kind of unnatural volume. Uh, as I mentioned, 15 to 20,000 evictions each year. That number has been pretty static for most of my career since 1996. It's been somewhere in that range. So if we suddenly had 10,000 evictions filed in a week, or I don't think it's impossible to see 50,000 evictions filed in a week, how the courts will be able to deal with that kind of volume is unknown. So how long will an eviction take? Well, the old system, 20 to 30 days, almost every eviction was done from the day the landlord filed the case to the day that the tenant was removed at the end, if necessary, by a sheriff. Didn't go that far very often, but that is the last phase of an eviction. Uh, that's the old answer, 20 to 30 days. The new answer, I think, is pretty unknowable how long the eviction process itself will take to play out. Um, and then a question about security deposits. How, uh, how are security deposits supposed to be used during the pandemic? Can a tenant use it to pay rent? Should the landlord return the money at, at walkthrough? So the security deposit rules haven't really changed meaningfully under COVID-19. I guess in my mind, the biggest uh, real change is that tenants can't sue for the return of their deposit because conciliation court isn't really available to them, which is where almost all uh, security deposit cases go. You could file in district court, but that's not really open for this kind of claim as well. So it's the fact that the tenant can't really pressure the landlord with a court case, but the rules are still there. So can a, a tenant use their deposit to pay the last month's rent? The law, the security deposit law, there's a specific security deposit statute, has a penalty built in if the tenant tries to do just that. Uh, unilaterally, the tenant says, you know what, I'm not gonna pay my last month's rent, use it to cover my deposit, landlord. Now the landlord can agree to that. Uh, in, in our experience, the only time landlords typically do agree to that is if the tenant's already gone. The tenant's leaving a month early, and they say, landlord, here are the keys, use my deposit to pay the last month's rent. And the reason why I say landlords are reluctant to do that is they can't know the condition of the place until the tenant is actually on their way out the door, hasn't you know, gotten all their things out. A big reason why is because damages occur most commonly, the, the really big sort of you know, bang into wall damages when people are moving in and when they're moving out. So even a careful tenant might cause damage the last day, the last hour that they were there. So landlords are really reluctant to accept a security deposit to pay the last month's rent. Like I said, the law does say that the tenant's not allowed to do it. Uh, it's got some hoops for the landlord to jump through, which honestly they don't jump through very often. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not a crime for a tenant to do this, to use their deposit to pay the last month's rent, but there is a potential civil penalty against them for forcing the landlord to take their deposit to cover the last month's rent. So there is a downside there for a tenant to do so. And that has not, none of those rules have changed since the COVID-19 pandemic occurred. Um, what, what, what if a guest of a tenant sets fire to something, but the resident was not involved? So these kinds of questions, uh, a landlord trying to file an eviction against a tenant or make a tenant pay for damages caused by somebody else. Uh, typically hinge, hinge on that, that key word in that question, which is the word guest. Was the person invited by the tenant uh, is a really critical legal question. Uh, 
Uh, and if they weren't, then probably the tenant's not gonna be responsible for the action of that person. But if it was an invited guest, then it's much more likely that the tenant's gonna be responsible. Maybe they could be evicted for endangering the safety of others, even under the COVID-19 moratorium on evictions, that that would fit into one of those narrow exceptions. But what if the tenant had a guest over, uh, they had a few drinks, it's a part of a lot of these stories, sadly, uh, and they asked that person to go because things are getting heated. Um, and the person refuses to go. Are they still a guest? At that point, it becomes much more difficult. Um, what if the tenant calls the police and asks to have them removed uh, and they don't go? And then while the police are en route, uh, then that person uh, sets the fire. Were they an invited guest at that point? I mean, it's actually a really fact-specific case-by-case kind of analysis that has to happen um, to try to figure out the answer to that question. Is it possible that a landlord could file an eviction for violation of the endangering the safety of other residents for that purpose? Sure. Um, and the fact that it was simply a guest does not mean that the uh, leaseholding tenant would be safe from an eviction because it wasn't them personally, but it was their guest. Uh, the real question is, was it their guest uh, from a legal perspective? All right, next question. Uh, in, the, in the midst of the pandemic and the governor's orders, how would a tenant insist that a work, uh, work person, I guess somebody, a, an agent of the landlord to come in to fix something, how, how would they insist that that person be masked and gloved during a repair to uh, their bathroom ceiling? Tenant will be gone, uh, and it sounds like the repair person doesn't really want to do this. Should I just post a note and hope? Uh, I, I'd go beyond posting a note. I'd be sending an email to the landlord. Um, look, the ultimate threat a tenant could make against a landlord here is, all right, so your employee comes in and they were asymptomatic, but I got COVID-19 from them. In fact, uh, where I went, I went to the park alone. I haven't had contact with people for four months, which in the past would have been sort of a ridiculous assertion, but these days there's people that have had no physical contact outside of their home for four months. It's true. Uh, and uh, I contracted COVID-19. I think it was because your worker was in my space for a long time. And when I returned, I got it from them being in there and the shared air or the surface areas, depending on whether or not that's still the prevailing view about how COVID-19 can be contracted. Uh, and you get sick uh, because of this. Arguably, you'd go after the landlord saying, hey, look, I didn't get COVID-19, but for your inability or refusal to adopt best practices safety-wise. Uh, and if you get really sick and die, then your estate has a wrongful death claim against the landlord. Uh, and I know that sounds like a, uh, just the, the worst extreme threat, but if you really wanna convince a landlord to convince their employee to wear a mask, which doesn't seem like that big of a request, uh, then that's, what I'd, that's sort of the, uh, the nuclear option that I'd go with. Um, you could do other things. There's, there's other approaches people would take in that situation. Hey, landlord, look, if this is what you do, I'm going to set up surveillance and I'm going to post it to social media and I'm going to show the world that this is what my landlord does. They don't care about the safety of their residents. There's not much in the, the landlord can do to stop you from posting what you perceive to be true. Look, look Facebook, look Yelp, look whichever social media site you want to use. I asked my landlord to have their caretaker wear a mask to come in and fix the bathroom ceiling, and they didn't. They, they refused to do so, and I think that's wrong, and I'm telling the world that it was wrong. And there's not much the landlord could do to stop you from doing that uh, if you wanted to make that kind of public declaration. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to even know what kind of impact that has. Maybe it'll be just a tiny ripple in the world. Maybe people will care about it a lot, but uh, those aren't empty threats for a tenant to make against a landlord. I assume you want the landlord to actually come in to make this repair. Um, so you don't wanna convince the landlord not to come in. You're just making re reasonable requests here. Uh, I'm talking about the extreme approaches to take. The starting one is an email or text to the actual decision maker here, the landlord saying, hey, your employee is saying they don't wanna wear a mask, but wow, uh, that would really make everything more comfortable and less uncertain for me. Uh, if you could do that because of my age, I'm, uh, higher risk group, and I just think it's uh, a legitimate precaution to ask for here. 
And then the next question, if a tenant has moved out but still owes money, can a landlord still take them to court? Yeah, the landlord could take the tenant to court. It's what kind of court they could go to. Um, if the tenant is already gone, they've given up possession, the landlord can't file the eviction. Uh, but they could sue for money, which is usually in conciliation court up to $15,000 in Minnesota. Uh, if the tenant owes money, they could sue them for that amount going forward. Yeah. Um, can a renter being displaced also ask for their deposit in hand as soon as they have a new address instead of waiting for the 21 days later? Families might need it for hotels or new deposits since leaving in a hurry. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm presuming a part of this question, let's just assume for a second that there's some rentals that were damaged uh, through the events of the last week. And it's an unlivable rental unit at this point because of that. Uh, there is a provision in the security deposit statute, the normal rule is 21 days. However, if the place is condemned, then it's uh, shortened to five days. The theory is behind this rule, um, if you're renting a place and the landlord is worried about the carpet and they think that you've damaged the carpet while you were there, the normal move out, the tenant goes, the landlord comes in, looks at the carpet and says, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I got to replace the carpet or shampoo it several times to try to clean it up. So uh, I'm going to charge you for that carpet cost. If the place is burned to the ground, it doesn't really matter what the tenant did to the carpet. That's not what wrecked the value of the place. The landlord shouldn't be keeping the deposit, so they shouldn't need that much time to figure out what, if anything, can they possibly charge the tenant for. So if somebody's living in a place and they, uh, and it got destroyed, uh, then they should have the right to get their deposit back within five days, as well as an argument for any prorated rent. So if they had paid rent on June 1st and on June 2nd, there was a fire then they should get, you know, 29 thirtieths of their rent back for June as well. And I just put a link to the statute uh, in there. Um, all right, next question. And it's the last one we have up here, I think. Um, somebody uh, has a client who's been renting with a specific landlord. They have made two evictions, filed two evictions against the tenant in the past due to non-payment of rent but resolved, uh, resolved the evictions each time. Tenants rent renewal came up during the pandemic, so they refused to re-sign, but did not kick tenant out. They're not accepting tenants rent, but plan to evict when it's over. What rights does this tenant have, or how can this um, person assist the client? Okay. Uh, one of those situations where I'd really want the tenant to call us directly. This is a little bit complicated. Um, when you're in law school, they actually give you law school exams. And one of your primary jobs is to look at a, a long fact pattern and isolate the 10 issues. And what you realize when you start practicing law is a lot of real life situations are just like that. They're law school exams where you've got to sort of piece together all the stuff. And this is one of those situations. I'll mention a couple big picture things here. Uh, the landlord, if they really want this tenant gone, it sounds like they're refusing rent, which is surprising because most landlords really like money, right? That's how they stay in business. They get the rent coming in. Um, so they must, I assume, really want her to go. And I think that does give them more leverage if they refuse to accept rent um, after the notice to vacate time ran out. Uh, in my mind, the question is going to be, the key question is going to be, how quickly can they get her out? Again, the governor's order uh, makes it so the landlord is not allowed to terminate the tenancy. Uh, during the peacetime emergency declaration. So whether a notice was given then uh, before the peacetime declaration or if it was given during the peacetime declaration might make a huge difference on what footing she has legally. I don't know that your client's going to have the right to insist on a full one-year uh, extension, but she might actually be in a situation where she's allowed to stay through the peacetime emergency and might not owe the rent uh, in theory. It's a little bit complicated. Like I said, we'd want to talk to her directly. And again, we're a free service, our tenant hotline, or they can email an attorney directly. Um, and uh, hopefully she can get in contact with us and we can get all the key details we need to give her the, the customized advice instead of a generalized answer. All right, we did have one other question that came in through the chat. Um, not specifically about Minneapolis. Uh, is, is Minnesota 
thinking of joining of a COVID related national effort to convert past due COVID rent to personal debt lump sum for 12 months going forward. Um, I, I have slightly been following this or some of our staff has, and I believe Homeline has signed on to a, uh, a letter regarding this. Um, I think it's, is there, there's a, like a new CARES Act it's called the HEROES Act that maybe does something. And I think there's some discussions around doing something like this on a national level. Um, I'm not sure how widespread folks are signing on to that, but there is an effort to do that through the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, so with that, I'm not seeing any other questions. So again, we'll uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we are really uh, thankful and glad that we're able to provide the, these uh, ongoing events and webinars and, and services for, for you all and for our clients um, and hope everybody's well. Again, next week, I was gonna try to put this up, but I'm having trouble. Um, next week, uh, we will be doing this again uh, on uh, Wednesday at 1.30, and, uh, and we will send out registration information to everybody who's joined today. Um, we did get one more question. Do you want to tackle it, Mike? Sure, sure. All right. Um, I f uh, feel like my landlord is charging a little too much rent for the condition of my unit. How do I know if I'm paying a reasonable amount for rent in my area? Yeah, uh, this is one of those things where a tenant should shop around. Um, it's not really legal advice. It's just kind of practical advice. Um, I mean, look in the places the tenants look to see if you've got a one bedroom in a certain neighborhood, you try to find other comparable uh, or comps uh, types of units in a neighborhood nearby or in your same neighborhood. You look on Craigslist, you look on Housing Link, um, in all those places and see what other landlords are charging. Uh, that's really the only truly effective way to try to do this. It's, it's very easy to find information about how much somebody paid to buy a house, um, at least in Minnesota, in most counties. Uh, it's not especially easy to find out how much people are paying for rent. It's not public record um, in most cases. Uh, it might be findable if a landlord filed an eviction and named the amount of rent that was being paid, but that kind of information is just not publicly knowable in a real massive sort of aggregate sense. So it is something that takes some investigation, but it is uh, learnable, yeah, at least to try to make an in informed guess. All right, so again, thank you all, uh, and we will potentially see you next week as we'll host the another uh, webinar next Wednesday at 1.30 and uh, all of the recordings and some of the materials and links that we've uh, sent today we will add to the page on our website where we'll have the recording and send that out to everybody afterwards. With that we'll close close it up. Thank you.